Good. Tell you what, while we are uh, waiting for the last couple of folks to show up, maybe we spend just a minute or two talking about who the audience is. Uh, we've got a, a large group of people here with a lot of stuff to go through and show, and it'll help us to make sure that we target the people who are here and what, the, what you're after uh, if I ask a couple of questions. So let me start out with sort of the most important one, perhaps. How many of you are contractors or installers? Okay. How many of you are contractors or installers who have actually installed a large format thin tile before? Got a couple. Okay, we have a couple of veterans. That's good. Uh, how about uh, people who are uh, general contractors or uh, designers? Any? One. Okay, we've got a couple of those. Uh, manufacturers. Anybody who manufactures some time? We've got a couple of folks I've recognized in the back over here. All right. Well, very good. Uh, forensics folks. Very good. So we, we, we kind of cover the gambit, so we'll try to do our best uh, during the course of the event to make sure we take uh, good care of everybody. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Neil McMurdy. I'm the Director of Research and Development for MAPE Corporation. Uh, we have a tag team going on today with an awful lot of folks. Let me introduce the rest of the speakers while I'm down here. Uh, first of all, uh, with us we also have here first uh, Noah Chitty, who is the Director of Technical Services for Crossville. Uh, to his left is Ben Zell, who is with European Tile Masters. Uh, who ben has been one of those who's been trying to find ways to make the tools to make all these things work. And on the end is my cohort, cohort uh, Dan Marvin, also from MAPE, another director of technical services, uh, responsible for helping to get the information out on how to do all this uh, stuff from the in mortar and installation side. So during the course of the event today, we'll go through and talk a lot about what's there, what we have available, and what's... Uh, what's coming uh, with the thin tile world. So let's go ahead and get started if we could. This is a continuing education course. Uh, hopefully a couple of you are here for continuing education credits. And so because of that, the format is such that we're going to try to give you some of the best, uh, latest, up, most up-to-date information that you can use. It's very uh, generic as far as the uh, in, any individual one uh, company or proprietary products. We're striving very much to give you the state of the art as we best we can uh, with you know, a wide swath of people's products and, and information. So if you are here for AIA credit, it only works if you fill out the card and see the lady out front before she leaves at 5, uh, 5.30, basically. Uh, whenever she gets done, we've got to make sure that you get those paperwork to her if you want to get credit. Now, when you signed up for the course, there were a couple of learning objectives that were shared, and we're going to do our best to address them. Uh, first of all, trying to make sure we answer the basic question of what on earth is a thin tile. Turns out that's a, that sounds like a simple question, but it's not. And so we'll try to make sure that we do a good job giving you at least a basic overview of what's out there and why, and, what, and why you should care. Okay, we'll look at the, thin, the types, we'll describe the uses, and then get into the basics of how to install these materials. The goal today is really to give you a first taste of what's out there. There's been a lot of work in the industry, and I think we'll be able to do that to give you an idea of where to go to start asking the right kind of questions. The reason being is that the thin tiles have been around now for a couple of years. They were originally announced at Shersai about 2009. A lot of fanfare, a lot of excitement, big tiles, thin, eco-friendly, well, you'll hear more about that. And at, at the Chersai announcement, basically, over in Italy, they asked the, the gentleman who's the head of my company to get up and comment. And it, Dr. Swinzy in Italy is uh, kind of well-known. Um, and his first comment out of, the, out of the box was, we have no clue how we're going to do this, so we better go slow. <laughs> and so at that point, he kind of marshaled the MAPE forces, as well as the Italian designers and the Italian tile industry and, and everybody else here in the Americas as well to try to work on what's going to happen. And really it leads to an awful lot of cutting edge applications and we're now delivering on the promise that occurred several years ago. We're looking at showers and shower enclosures with porcelain tiles and no grout joints, countertops, exterior cladding, tiling radiuses. The possibilities are just beginning to really be explored out here because you can start out certainly with a lot of walls, a lot of ceilings, the big market, you know, for those of you who are laying tile, we know that uh, there's an awful lot of flooring out there too. And getting the, the bridge between what you can do on the walls and what you can do on the floors and how to work with these materials is really what we've been working on for the last couple of years. So our goal today is to give you some basic an, an understanding of what's there, what's going on, what's the state of the art, and help you to ask the right kind of questions. Now in order to be able to do that, 
uh, we're going to delve a little bit deeper and try to start out with a couple of, of key points that you'll hear pretty much from everybody. So this is one a couple things to remember. First of all, all thin tiles are not created equal. Okay, That's rule number one. All right, we'll talk about why as we go through this. You need to make sure that before you try to use any of these things, you know what they're intended for and where they're intended for and how they're to be used and make sure that you ask the right kind of questions. We'll talk about the Robinson testing and things that have gone on as part of this to try to make sure we get the right tile for the right resource. And, and making sure, too, that if you're in the design phase, don't just specify it. Make sure you're asking questions. The tile manufacturers have gotten very good at this point in trying to help you be guided into what material to use where. Make sure you're asking those questions. You'll hear about it. And then at that point, really, it is turning the possibilities open. This is a whole new market space. We all want to grow the tile industry. Now we have an opportunity. So with that, let me uh, pass the microphone and the torch over to my, my good friend Noah Chitty here, and he'll talk about the manufacturing technologies. So as Neil was saying, <clears throat> what's important to know is you know, why did these things come about? Um, and the real reason was innovation in the marketplace. You know, they've been created by people who create equipment for tile manufacturers, and they were looking at kind of what is the next innovation. Um, obviously, there's less energy because the material is, is thinner, and we can put more material and square footage on a truck, which is going to have a lot of environmental benefit as far as, you know, savings in that realm. But one of the more, most important things is that while we're looking at panels, you know, most of them now in the three to six millimeter range, these manufacturers are really talking about making large porcelain panels, um, things that can go in new applications that we haven't thought about. So even though we're looking at thin products now, the manufacturing technology is about large panels. Um, and it's a new way to, you know, manufacture things. And we'll look a little bit of difference in the technologies of, of the pressing and things like that. So the tiles are now being made mainly in Italy and Spain and Turkey, um, a little bit in China, and those are the products that we're first seeing in the marketplace. So some of the manufacturing things, probably the biggest innovation uh, is the press itself. The press that makes these tiles actually eliminates the die cavity, and we'll look at a little bit about that. But one of the other things is a hybrid kiln. Traditionally, we fire in a natural gas kiln. Um, but by firing in a hybrid kiln, which is using natural gas and electricity, we can more control the cooling cycle, and we can leave a lot of the, relieve a lot of the stresses that can occur from the manufacturing process through this hybrid firing technology. So we'll look a little bit about terminology, because we keep calling it thin tile, but what are the processes and what are the products that you're going to see in the marketplace? So the main one that we see is lamina technology. So this lamina technology is actually created by the System Corporation who built the machinery to create these large thin tiles. They create a product in their own factory called laminum, and you'll see that product in the marketplace, but they also sell that same technology to other manufacturers who make tiles through other trade names in the marketplace using lamina technology. So while the terms get batted around a lot, it's important to know there's a laminum product made by the manufacturer with lamina technology, and then the lamina technology is also sold to others, and you see them through different trade names in the marketplace. Continua is probably the other main technology that we see, um, and it's created by the SACME Corporation. And it's a little bit different because SACME didn't create a product. Um, they created some technology, and it's used by others uh, in the marketplace to create thin tiles, although it's really looking like we're not seeing very much of these products in the marketplace. I haven't actually seen a product in the U.S. marketplace made by the Continua process. Um, and then traditional dust pressing is most of the tiles that you, you know, touch today are made by the traditional dust pressing process. So this is the lamina process, and what's different about it is the powder is delivered onto a belt, and it comes out in a pile of powder, goes through an initial compaction roller to densify the material, and then through a final pressing operation. 
Before we get into continuum, what's really different about the press and the laminate process is that in a traditional dust pressing operation, I think this type of process, what we do is we fill a metal cavity full of powder and then we compact it through a hydraulic press and it forces the material against the outside of the die and the size of the shape of piece that we get out is defined by the mold that we put it into. What's really different about the laminate process is there's actually no mold. So by pressing, in a, with pressing without a mold, we eliminate some of the stresses that we get when we compact against the outside of the mold. So we actually have the possibility of creating somewhat of a stronger material by pressing without a mold. It also gives us, as a manufacturer, a lot of flexibility because we don't have to have one press making 18 by 18s and one press making 12s and one press making 24 by 24s. With this type of process, we can make a large piece and then cut the sizes that we want. And it's important, again, to know that while we're seeing the thinner products in the marketplace, the manufacturers are saying that they can produce traditional thickness tile with these type of operations. So from an efficiency standpoint as a manufacturer, it really has the possibility to change the game for the way we manufacture tile. And that's why we're excited about it and that's why we think the, the process itself is kind of here to stay in our marketplace. If we look at, let me go backwards. So this is the continua process, and it's sort of the same. It has this initial continual, continuous compaction um, to take some of the air out. And originally the processes were created to eliminate what's after the press, which is the decoration line. So typically what we do is we press a tile, we dry a tile, we decorate it, glaze it, whatever operation might be, and then we fire that process. So the technology was really thought about to eliminate that, could we decorate it before we actually press it and eliminate a whole stage out of the manufacturing process. So that's where some of the initial thoughts of the technology came from. So what are we seeing in the marketplace? Um, three millimeters to six millimeters seems to be the product range. So we're talking about an eighth inch to about a quarter inch products. Um, most of the products seen by the lamina process um, at currently, although they're working on larger sizes, are three meters by one meter, um, the kind of size that you see behind us. Um, we have seen 10 foot by five foot products in the marketplace. Um, those products seem to be made by a proprietary process that's a little bit different than lamina. Um, and more sizes all the time as additional things are kind of being looked at. Uh, one of the things that's important to know is that, like Neil said, even though they're all made by the lamina process, you need to kind of look at the products as individual outputs of these different, because even though they bought the equipment, they may use a different firing cycle, they may use different meshes and glues, they may use different things, and just like you see different porcelains on the marketplace, all called porcelain, you need to kind of evaluate the products on a case-by-case -case basis to see what their individual physical characteristics are and how they're going to react. We're going to see more sizes come on as the plants start, and then all the sizes that come out from this. So while the large size is, is the maximum size, some contractors are, are much more comfortable with the pieces that can come out of this, a one meter by one meter piece or a quarter panel or a six panel, um, and then five by five, two and a half by five, so all kinds of different sizes. And we see some products with mesh, and without mesh, and that's also a differentiation between the pieces. So we think the technology is here to stay from a manufacturing process. Even if it moves into a traditional thickness, which we think both will end up in the marketplace, um, and they're there from energy and efficiency gains driven by the economics and obviously sustainability. Um, and depending on the marketplace, the goal is to expand the market. The designers are starting to really like these products. Um, they've always liked porcelain tile. They never really liked grout joints. So this really gives them some of the things that, you know, they can grasp onto and look at new applications for tile and we can drive it into applications. And as contractors, you can look at it as an opportunity to put tile in places that you haven't put it before. It really is an opportunity. Um, and it's a win-win as long as we stay in front of the product problems, we look at the issues that are there with the products, and we use education as a tool. And it's really the same thing that would happen with glass. When we first started to see glass come into the marketplace, we didn't know what it was, we needed to define what the products were, but when we started to educate ourselves about how to install glass, what the differences were, we really saw it expand into the marketplace and people start to embrace it as a new thing. Turn it over to Dan, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about standards. 
could, could be a short discussion. Let me have that clicker. One of the challenges all the folks behind me have is trying to sort of demystify that this product for you. Uh, that's why we're here. And that's why we've spent a lot of time on trying to train, trying to educate, and trying to come up with methods that work. One of the biggest challenges for us right now is there really aren't any existing methods, or sorry, existing specifications for the product or for the installation methods. Um, how many here, just show of hands, are, are familiar with the TCNA handbook? So for those of you that are familiar with it, and those of you aren't, probably should be. Those of you who aren't, uh, the TCNA handbook has a lot of information about different methods for installing tiles in different installation applications. Uh, there is one section in here that's particularly relevant for thin tiles, and that's this rating system from residential up to heavy commercial. And I'll get into a lot more details on that. So are there standards yet? Not really. Um, there are standards for tile, Porcelain tile falls under A137.1, an ANSI standard, and there are also ISO standards in the European community which apply to tile itself. The challenge is because the tile is much thinner, it doesn't meet many of the requirements of 137.1. We know it works because there are a lot of installations, especially in Europe, but increasingly here in the United States, where the product's working fine. So it's not the necessarily that it doesn't pass the ANSI 137.1 spec that's the issue. It's that we haven't really done a good job of defining what the product is and what the product isn't. And so that's what a lot of the standards committees are working on, both here in the US and also in Europe. What you're probably going to see, what the kind of the tone of the industry is right now, is to come up with an ANSI 137.X, 137.3. It'll have some number like that, similar to what we have for tile and then for also glass tile, like Noah was alluding to a moment ago. You're going to have a list of tests that it has to comply with, a list of numbers that you have to meet a certain threshold to be considered a 137.3 tile, for instance. The reason we have to come up with an all new specification is because there's a lot of questions that a tile this big brings up. Uh, if you're installing 12 by 12 tiles, you can pop up every 25th tile and check coverage like you're supposed to. That's, that's doable. Try to pop one of these up and you're going to have a, a, a bit of a challenge, especially because we're asking as the industry for you to get about 95% coverage on the back of this tile. It's almost virtually impossible to pull one of these up without breaking it. So it's just issues like that that tile manufacturers and installation companies are trying to get their hands around when it comes to putting together a standard. Uh, there are some areas where the current standard works fine. Coefficient of friction, the slip resistance of a tile, that applies. You can measure that on this piece of tile and it, it applies just like it would for a regular tile. Uh, things like shade variation, all the kind of the, the standard top of the tile sort of tests all apply. But once you get to things like breaking strength or point, point load strength, those sort of things, we have to actually develop new test, new test methods in a lot of cases. So the question, how do we live in a world without standards? Well, uh, that's why we've got the panel put together the way it is. What's happening in the industry is increasingly, and to, to my knowledge, I haven't been around the industry almost 25 years now, no other product category has brought together setting materials manufacturers, tile manufacturers, tool manufacturers to tackle a problem quite like thin tile has. And that's what you're starting to see happen. You know, we've, we've got people here on this panel from all of those areas because it's important as a system that you understand how to install the product. It's not just another tile, it's a whole system that you need to put it together correctly. Uh, make sure you're getting the training so you feel comfortable. The last thing you want to do is accept a job, bid it out, walk in and see one of these sitting there. That you, you want to be doing your homework up front to make sure you understand that what the tile is, how it goes down, what sort of extra precautions. You're going to need two, probably three people to do an installation here. It's not just one guy with a trowel. You're going to have to have a fair amount of help to, to work with these products. I do want to spend just a little bit of time talking about one particular test because what we've been doing for the last six, five, six years is learning a lot about how the systems do go together. And there's one particular test that you'll hear referenced um, called the Robinson Floor Test. 
There's also a different, slightly different variation of it called the universal floor tester. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. If you came to our talk on Monday, thank you. Uh, we did go into a lot of details on what the difference between the two pieces of equipment are. But just to, to save time today to get to the important stuff, I'm just going to say these two uh, things are very similar, a little bit different, but they test essentially how much load the tile, the tile system, including the setting materials, the tile itself, the grout, the whole system can take from a rolling load. Uh, this is our universal floor tester uh, that we've done a lot of testing with. And by testing, I mean we're putting together what mortar works, what methods work for putting the mortar down, uh, what tools we recommend. A lot of the recommendations in our installation guides have come directly from this piece of equipment because we've gone through and seen what doesn't work, what fails. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, this isn't a standard test bed for the universal tester or the Robinson tester. This is a specialized piece of, uh, we put together the spans particularly to measure uh, two pieces of this thin tile back to back. Normally the, the bed would be about four feet square. Uh, we'd be testing six by sixes or 12 by 12s, which we could put a bunch of them on there. Because this tile is so large, we couldn't do that here. So we really have one grout joint. There's two different kinds of grout in this installation that we're testing. And we're, we're checking that one particular area for lippage and breakage. And I'll get into another slide that shows exactly what the failures look like. Oops, I'm going backwards. So here you can see the uh, how the testing is done. Um, what we're looking for here is that service rating. Remember I showed you in the book just a minute ago that goes from residential up to heavy commercial. That service rating is what's driving all this testing. We want to make sure that we're, if it's going in a residential installation, you're probably okay with, with uh, most mortars, most grouts. But as you get up higher and higher on that scale, you're going to be needing to pay more attention to your technique, the materials you're using, the tile itself. Here you can see the machine in action. Uh, you've got a gauge down here in the bottom right that's actually uh, measuring the deflection in this system. So what we're trying to do is intentionally make this thing bend a little bit. We want to see, is this product capable of standing up to an installation where there's a little bit of flex in the system? Can we put it on a second floor? Can we put it on plywood? These are the kind of questions we haven't really answered yet that we need to know before we tell you what, what we think the product can be used for. So the net result is we get a rating from residential to heavy commercial based on how many cycles it can go through. We start out with a soft rubber wheel, that's cycle one with a very little bit of weight. We ramp up the weight, then we go to a heavy rubber wheel uh, uh, with, again, weights from 50 pounds up to 300 pounds, and then we go to a steel wheel. If it gets all the way through the 14 cycles with that steel wheel with a lot of weight on it, we're pretty confident that it's going to stand up to whatever you can put on it from a commercial standpoint. Uh, we've even gone so far as to stick some of this stuff out in the Florida sunshine to see when it expands. Does the system still hold up or does it peel up? Um, a lot of the questions are what do you have to use for expansion because you're supposed to have expansion joints every, every so far. Uh, these are some of the typical failures we see in the testing. Um, this is a very typical edge chip. If you have any lippage at all, you can kind of get into a situation where you're going to see this with a wheel running over it. Uh, that's why in our guides we recommend a leveling system. If you're not familiar with them, they really help with, with laying this tile down. Um, you can see some of the other crushing defects. This may have had a void underneath it where there wasn't some mortar, or it might be the actual tile itself was breaking down. We do a forensic check where we'll pull the tile up and see what was going on underneath it in that particular area. What have we found then from the universal floor tester? Well, we found some interesting things. Uh, first, you shouldn't use a standard trowel with this product. A square notch trowel is going to get you in trouble. And uh, Ben's going to go through a lot more on the tools themselves, but we do recommend specific trowels for this product that, that allow you to uh, interlock the, the trowel marks on the back of the tile and the, and the floor itself. We're recommending. Uh, as near 100% coverage as possible. This tile being thin, it doesn't do well when it's not supported underneath. So we definitely don't want any gaps or voids. Um, use of an orbital sander or something similar to get the air out. You have to work the air out for sure to, to make sure you have good contact. Again, like I was saying before, mechanical edge leveling system. And then uh, as far as the adhesives, and, and uh, Dr. McMurdy will go into this more, uh, we do recommend higher end adhesives, not just because we like to sell you more higher end adhesives, but because they really work best in all the Robinson testing that we did. So with that, I'll turn it back over.
sometimes things have unintended consequences. I started talking down here just because we were waiting for folks to show up, and now this has sort of become the, uh, this, the, the podium. So we're going to keep going on down here. When we started this testing a couple years back, the goal was to try to find a way to install these tiles that wouldn't just pass the test, but that it was something that we could then turn around and teach as a set of techniques to installers that you could actually do in the real world. Uh, we don't need some kind of special artist who can come in and jerry-rig a test so that it, you, know, you can always pass it. That wasn't the goal. We really wanted to find robust, universal ways of putting things together so that at the end of the day, we could teach the industry what to do next. Because as Dr. Swinsey had said, we have no idea. Well, we had to get some good ideas. We had to get them out there fast. One of the things that came out of the Robinson testing and the things that went on uh, fairly early with this is rediscovering something I think everybody who's laid more than a few inches of tile already knows. All right? And it's absolutely imperative that whenever you're dealing with the large format tiles, uh, as with any other large format tile that the, the, the we've, we've defined anywhere, regardless of thickness, this, the substrate preparation is absolutely key. Uh, probably uh, paramount amongst all this is, is the flatness of the substrate. Uh, there's a lot of work that's gone on for folks like me and, and Dan and Noah and everybody else who've spent a lot of the time writing all those standards in that big book that you saw, where we said, look, uh, you can't go ahead and use thin sets and adhesives as, as a way of leveling a floor or fixing somebody else's problem. It just creates far more disasters downstream, and then everybody doesn't, everybody's unhappy, the owner doesn't like it, and we don't go back for a second installation somewhere. So. As part of this process, uh, when we went through it, one of the things that we again learned is that surface prep is key. You want to make sure that you've got, a lot, with a large format system, that the floor or surface is as close as you can get to an eighth of an inch and ten by the standards from the TCNA guidelines and, and, and the ANSI standards as you can. A lot of ways to do that with mortar beds, a lot of ways to do that with self-leveling, uh, renders if you're on the wall. But that's one of the keys. So if you're trying to come in and lay these products down on something that's got a lot of wave and, and got, it's not going to work, because in many cases, for, especially for the thinner materials, they'll follow that contour, and you look down the side of the wall and you can see, you know, the uh, wave. So getting the floor absolutely flat or getting the, the substrate absolutely flat is, is one of the most important keys for this, and it does tend to give you much better ratings when when you you follow through and take care of things. Now. We talked, too, about the adhesives. Um, for those of you that are used to maybe half-inch uh, uh, half trowels or quarter by three-eighths by quarter square notches, if I hold up this trowel like this, you're going to wonder what planet I'm probably from. Okay. The story behind this kind of a trowel, and Ben will show you a little more later, is we tried just about every trowel known to man to try to find some way to reproducibly put the mortar down and get it to collapse right so we got the coverage we needed for these, uh, for these particular trowel, for these thin tiles. That was the trowel that sort of un was the key that opened the lock to getting us the result that we needed, and I'll show you some more pictures in a minute. And you, I, I'd encourage you to come up and take a look at this, uh, a look at the, at this trowel. As we were working through the, the mortars themselves, we tried an awful lot of things. I uh, tried a lot of different uh, combinations of materials. And without giving you the entire blow by blow, because we don't have that many days, the things that we found as part of this process can be summarized really in two major points. First of all, uh, you can't use the quarter by three eighths by quarter uh, that you might think of for standard sort of bigger tiles. It really does require a trowel like this, and that means that you really need a medium bed capable mortar. A couple of things that the medium bed mortars do for you uh, is, especially if you, if you get the ones that have the ANSI classification uh, with this T that I'll talk about in a minute, is they are able to support the tile, hold it where you put it, but still flow nicely, keep the open time, and allow you to work. When you're dealing with something that's as big as this piece of tile, you basically are going to use one bag of mortar per tile. That's going to give you somewhere between a long uh, quarter inch setting bed and a short three eighth setting bed behind it in order to actually get the mortar on. If you don't have a medium bed mortar with some open time, one guy trying to trowel all 65 square feet <laughs> and then get it all put together, you get drying, you have all kinds of other issues. So if you're really laying the big tiles and even the smaller pieces, 
the, the medium bed mortars uh, are, are really a key because they give you the time that you need and the support that you need to make this work. There are a couple of standards that are out there that are available that we, we talk about uh, from the ISO 13007-1, which is included in the, in the TCNA handbook. That's my personal favorite. Uh, that mortar gives you the high strength that is good for heat, cold, water, all kinds of different things that this in, in, in the environment that, that a tile might actually see. It has oops, this T rating. T stands for thixotropic. Okay, million dollar word. What does that actually mean? Uh, probably the best description of thixotropic is house paint for most people. If you took a glass of water dip the paintbrush in it and painted it on the wall, it all runs down to the bottom. Okay? If you go into house paint, you dip it in, the paint goes in nicely, it coats everything, you put it on the wall and you can build out a nice layer of paint and it stays there. It may run a little bit if you get too thick, but for the most part it will stay there and hold a film. Thixotropic materials are materials that when you, when you beat on them a little bit, they get thinner. So you can put it on your brush or spread it on the wall at a level. But then after a short period of time, they build viscosity and stay there. The mortars do the same thing. So both putting it on the wall or putting it down where you want it, it stays there. And then when you lay the tile in, it still maintains that property so the things don't slide down the wall or, or sink in the mortar bed or do whatever. It holds things in place. It builds that viscosity that you need so stuff stays where you want it to be. So. If you're going to work with these materials, I'm going to suggest over and over and over again, you're looking for that ANSI or an ISO T rating uh, for whatever you're going to use, because I promise you it will make your life an awful lot easier. The E okay, is an extended open time test. It's been in the ISO standard for a long time. It just came in with the new with publications of the ANSI standards as well. The ANSI standard adopted the ISO E test and just put it in there. That extended open time test is, of course, a laboratory test that only a true nerd like me could love, but it's done, and it's done under 72 degrees, 50% relative humidity, but it stays open for a half hour. Okay. <laughs> that is a special property to make sure that when you go through and you comb all this stuff in one place and on, the, on, and on your substrate, and by the time you can get it all together, it'll still flow and still stick. So this is what you want to be looking for. It's something you want to work with your mortar manufacturer. Every one of the mortar manufacturers knows what these tests are. They know how to run them. They know what their mortars are able to do. Ask for it by name. Okay? And then you'll, you'll get a much better result. You know, whether it's floor, floors or walls, you're in, you're in a much better place. Now, there's one other part of that ISO test. Okay, this little S1 on the end. Again, I'm not trying to teach you to speak geek, but it is an important test. All right? It really looks at the ability of the mortar to deal with deflection, vibrations, you know, you know, walls bouncing, wind beating on things, a uh, little bounce in the floor. The mortars that have and can pass that ISO 13007 S1 rating or a higher S2 rating are materials that have a higher loading of additional polymer, they're, they tend to be a lot stronger. They're able to deal with deformation. And when you're looking at something this long and this big, you know, coefficient of expansion because of heat and thermal stresses as well as vibrations are key. So you need something to make sure that your, your glue that's holding the tile to your substrate can take a little more punishment. Uh, that's what this is really all about. So whenever you're dealing with these materials, truly suggest that the ANSI 1815, in order to pass that, you end up with a lot of the properties of the S1. But talk to your mortar manufacturer. If you really want to keep yourself in the best position, get yourself at least a minimum of the ISO 13007 S1 mortar or S2. Okay? And they all know what that is. They can tell you. Uh, make sure you, you work with them. Now, we've also done applications as well with epoxy mortars. Um, I showed you a picture at the very beginning that was actually out of a uh, out of a department store in New York City where they did the stuff on the ceilings. It was early in the process. That was all done with an epoxy mortar as well right, so to hold this stuff in place. And depending upon your application, there are epoxy mortars that may be appropriate as well. The key, okay, and we'll say it a thousand times, work with the tile manufacturer, work with, the in, with, the, with your insulation material manufacturer and understand what the application is and what you need it to do and how much it needs to stay in place and what kind of uh, things it's going to have to go through. 
but there are materials out there that will work for this. We've done the testing with, with the Robinson type testing that, that Dan was showing you, and we've proven over and over again that if you've got a tile that can stand the high service ratings, any of these mortars will work to deliver you that rating. Okay, with, with the process that we've come up with that's been published now by both MAPE as well as a lot of the other tile manufacturers and installation material people, because that guidance is kind of converged. You can keep doing this reproducibly and get the good result. Now, uh, grouting. Okay, there, again, there's not nearly as much grout joint as there used to be, but it is still an important part. A couple of reasons why. Uh, number one, there are you, know, you still got to have some way to accommodate the small amount of warpage or change or thermal expansion. So you really have to make sure that you uh, know what you're doing. We've done a lot of the Robinson type testing. All right? What I found is that I can make an epoxy grout work, I can make a cementitious grout work. And if I have a good tile that reproducibly gives me an extra heavy commercial or other good rating, that's reproducible. All right, the big, the big, uh, expand, or the big joints that you saw with, with two tiles butted together that Dan was showing, half of that was grouted with, uh, with epoxy on one side and cement on the other. <laughs> Didn't see a difference as the wheel rolled over either one. Uh, so that's really okay, but you've got to work with your manufacturer and, and with your designer and look at what's going on. But they are they are possible. So service use is key. You can use a uh, the, an epoxy grout. Either way, please always make sure that you're getting one that meets the ANSI and ISO standards. So either if it's, if it's a regular grout, a cement grout, uh, there should be a CG2 or an ANSI 118.7. If it's an epoxy grout, the RG rating or, or minimum or ANSI 118.3. If you do that, you get yourself the best possible combination. For a lot of applications, an epoxy grout is preferred because it gives a little extra oomph around the edges because that seems to be where these things fail. But it's not absolutely mandatory if you get the right system. Can't say enough. <laughs> okay, make sure that you've planned for expansion. All right. If you've been, if you've done forensics, you've probably seen, or if you've been an installer, you've probably seen where somebody forgot to put it a uh, any kind of an expansion joint in a very long floor. And all of a sudden, overnight, there's an explosion, and two tiles are sitting in the middle of the floor, you know, like a little pup tent. Okay, you can take your Boy Scouts there, or maybe you bring your pet rat in and let it live in the tent. This is something that, when you've only got one grout joint across 20 feet, you got to make sure we're planning for. So, think about it, work with your manufacturer, and, we'll, and we should take it from there. Now. Key to, key to all this, and you'll see more as part of this process that came from the original work on the Robinson testing, was figuring out how to lay down the mortar. We had to find the right trowel. I've showed you the right trowel. Now how do you use that trowel? Well, it turns out that if I want to reproducibly take the mortar and the installation system out, the bulletproof belt and suspenders method was to use that trowel, use the medium bed mortar, make sure it was an ANSI you know, 118.15 or an ISO 13007 C2 TES1 mortar or plus, and then, more importantly, comb the, comb the uh, trial ridges in the, in the right direction. What everybody recommends, and it may be a little hard to see in this picture, is that you comb in a straight parallel direction so that you are using the shortest lines possible, basically either perpendicular to the, to the long direction or parallel to the short direction, however you want to say it, it's the same thing. You set up a whole series of lines. And you want to make sure that it's not sorely and it's not pretty. You don't want pretty here. You want nice and straight lines, okay? just like a farmer laying out his crops. At the same time, whatever you're laying it down on should have the mortar also pre-troweled out using the same trowel in the exact same configuration. The thing that you're thinking of basically is a Ziploc bag. Okay? If you have the lines on one side, the lines on the other, you want them to line up, you start squeezing this way, you get all the air out of it, and you're able to collapse the ridges with this trail and that property and do things that we probably never even dreamed we could do so using the standard quarter by three-eighths by a quarter trail. This is probably the most important result that came out of all that Robinson testing. Once we did that, boom, <laughs> we could get extra heavy ratings, we could do all kinds of things that were not even possible before. Now the tile still had to hold up to it, but it gave us a reproducible way of laying down the tile that a trained installer uh, with you know, reasonable skills could do day in and day out. And this is now what, if you, somebody comes out and does a training for you from XYZ manufacturer and PDQ uh, mortar manufacturer, you're going to hear the same thing.
uh, there was a tremendous amount of debate <laughs> it's going through the process. Should we do it at parallel or do it crosswise? We proved with the Robinson testing that the only way to make it work was with that. So this is the benefit of a lot of knowledge and a lot of work to get that, to, to get that done. But if you do it this way, lay it up with the tools that now exist that you'll see more about, we can successfully apply the tiles. It takes a lot of the mystery and a lot of the, the scare factor out of it if you do this correctly. All right. You heard a little bit before about the, uh, uh, the, the, the orbital sander. How do we how do we burp the system? All right. Certainly for vertical applications on walls. All right. Once you get it all laid up and you've used the Ziploc bag effect, using an orbital sander, starting in the middle and working your way out again, you're just kind of doing that last little squeeze. It's worked real well. On floors, it's been used. There are a couple of different recommendations out there. Again, every tile's different, right? and the people who, who know your tile, who are making your tile, will give you their favorite recommendation because depending upon who makes what, there's more flex, there's more bend, there's, some, there's, there's lots of different things out there. So listen to the manufacturer. Uh, what I'll tell you as a, as a grout and mortar person is that, you know, <laughs> we want to use the right kind of fixotropic mortar. We'll find a way to help you work the air out, uh, but we'll also listen to the tile manufacturer because they understand their warp and bow. But it's possible, and you want to have this as a, as a way to make sure you get that last little bit of air out of it, and you'll have a lot of success. Now, we also found very quickly that there's really no way to lay these very, very large tiles and do it successfully and reproducibly and get good service ratings unless you use an edge leveling system. Uh, it's, you know, it's a little tough to line up 12 by 12s and still get those perfect. What do you do across 10 feet? Okay? Uh, and make sure that you don't have a small area of lipid or bow or some you know, warp and whatever, unless you're looking for that kind of an effect. So there are a number of edge leveling systems that are out there. We've done a lot of testing with them. When we got through with the Robinson testing, when we smashed over top of them, we'd cut them apart, do cross-sectioning making sure that we saw good coverage. And what we found universally is that if used properly and used cor correctly according to the manufacturer directions, it was, a, it was always a net positive. And it gave you the chance to get the best possible rating out of the tile. Things were flat. Folks who tried to apply them without, the, w with the edge loading system who said, nah, I don't, I don't want, this is too big of a hassle, tried it without, usually would go back by, the, by halfway through the job to the edge leveling system and swear by them ever since. So a lot of them that are out there, uh, it lets you, you know, make sure the things work well and keep, keep the edges nice and flat, and it does a lot of the work for you. Yes? Pardon? What tends to happen with these okay, and is two, twofold. Number one, uh, you lay down your first piece of tile, you stick the tabs underneath. The wet suction is so great on these large tiles that basically you aren't going to move it, and it pulls the next tile down. And so it helps a lot that way. There is still some oozing of the mortar that you got to deal with. Lo and behold, the next picture. Okay, there are. Here's here's where they did use an edge leveling system, one of the original ones, and they had to, a bit soft of a mortar, so it all squeezed, squeezed up a little bit. Uh, they didn't clean, weren't able to clean underneath the original tabs. A lot of the folks who are out there now are creating tabs that you can open back up, clean the mortar up before it's totally dried so that you make your life a lot easier. So if you want to avoid leaving this line, because if you come back two days later and, and one of these really fantabulous uh, uh, mortars that's got all these wonderful ISO ratings has totally set, it's going to be a tough day okay, to get it all cleaned out. So this is the latest, absolute latest in development in this as in this iteration process goes are the removable tabs that you can come back within the first couple of hours and pull it. The thixotropic mortars will also make sure that the stuff doesn't change while you're making the move. Okay, here's just an example of guys who are using the process. You can see the trowel lines on the wall, again, perpendicular to the longest side. It's the same thing as done on the tile. Two guys lay it up, and there you go. This is always at least a two-man job, okay? Uh, for, for the for average mere mortals, okay. So because to trowel it all out, to, to lay it, to lift it, to take care of it, you're going to want to use a rack. Again, this is not something new. There are folks who've been using very very large panes of glass, you know, putting sky skyscrapers together forever. So a lot of the things that were used to move glass are now being used to move these large tiles, and we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just finding the best way to do it in, for our industry. And as long as you follow the process we've talked about, you get pretty good shape. Okay.
And if you try to go back and you're really good and try to check coverage, you'll see when you follow through this process just how good a coverage you really had. So this is the best system. It's reproducible and with little training. Now, this is just one more quick advertisement. Make sure that you always follow the EJ-171. Okay. That's the designation from the big book. Okay. It talks about how to space it and how, how, what kind of a soft joint to use. That's really the next area we're doing a lot of studying on. That's why you saw the big uh, assembly that we're doing in, in our labs there at MAPE. We're looking at how this applies for these large format tiles. That will continue to evolve, so stay tuned for further developments. But whatever you do, make sure that you're aware and you're doing your best to follow the EJ-171. Okay. Let me go ahead. Ben. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is it on? Uh, there you go. Well, um, as you can see, the tile manufacturers make beautiful products. Interior decorators love the product. Homeowners love the product. I had an incident where uh, a lady called me one time, and she wasn't a distributor, wasn't an installer. She was a homeowner. Ended up choosing these big panels, and the contractor showed up, and he said that I, I don't know how to do it. Why don't you pick 12 by 12 tiles? True story. And the lady said, no way. I love these panels. So the contractor says, well, I, I really can't help you. She didn't stop with that. She started doing research and found a way, eventually came to our company, uh, to uh, see how these products can be moved, how can they be cut and installed, because she would not give up the idea that she's going to have these panels in her bathroom and some other areas in her house. Well, long story short, we helped her out, and she provided the equipment as a homeowner to the installer, that's how badly she wanted the tiles. And uh, of course he was uh, impressed and happy to do the job and have the equipment. But what does this tell us? That as this gentleman mentioned before, these tiles are here to stay. But there is a fear that we want to take out of this whole equation as a tool manufacturers and, and designers because the, le the weak link right now is the installation and the installers. They shy away from it. They're not used to handling panels like this. And logistically, uh, and Tim and I, we did this this afternoon with Freeman. They sold us, they didn't sold us, they kind of rented two gentlemen with their time that we had to buy to get these in. But if you think about it, those panels came in through the ocean. They landed at somebody's distributor's location. They were shipped here, but they were downstairs. We are on third floor. Now, we had to get those up somehow. And they were actually, when we had the right system, they were not that difficult. That uh, product called a uh, Euro uh, Transporter can, for example, handle eight panels. All together, actually we put in as many as 10. We were pushing approximately $8,000 worth of material safely. We had to get two people because of, uh, of requirements, but really one person like Brian, he's very, very strong, by the way. He, uh, he, can, he can handle that by himself. This is a huge thing, because if we're not able to move it up to the third floor or fifth floor, whatever, then we got a problem. So we are looking at a type of material that is beautiful, but I call it spineless. It just doesn't have a spine. So we have to come up with a solution to be able to pick it up, handle it. That's one of the options over there uh, next to the wall. It's called a Euro slide, and then there's another version over here where we had, and Neil has showed a couple of pictures already, how those frames were used to put the tile up on the wall or on the floor or on the ceiling, depending on where it goes, on countertops. I mean, the, uh, the, the amount of square footage that opened up for the industry, luxury yachts, airplanes, elevators, where the weight was an issue before, exterior facades can be done with this type of material. But we, have to need, we need to have the proper equipment. So there are going to be some... Um, situations that are very unorthodox. For 50, 60, 100, I don't know, 2,000 years, we told people, not person, I'm not that old, not to step on fresh tile. You know, we, we, we block the room off and everything. Now we are encouraging the installers to, to step on the tile. And I'm not sure if it's going to actually move on with these pictures and see what we got over there. Tools of the trade. 
Uh, so let's start with the first picture here, and I get back to the, uh, the walking on the tile. What's really important, because the tiles are so, the panels are so huge, is there's no way that you can use a, a regular wet saw on the job site and put this huge piece up and cut it. So we had to invent some, some uh, new tools, and the tool industry is quite equipped. We started this back in Europe when they, before they came to this uh, side of the ocean, these panels, to develop equipment such as the, the Carocut. And this, we have four different sizes, and there are many sizes out there. And, and these uh, cutters are designed to score and snap as little as, as uh, half-inch strips by 10 feet, which is quite impressive. So it's, it's going to show it to you later on. Uh, but these are absolutely necessary, easy to carry around, you bring it to the job site. And the nice thing is that an installer can actually fabricate different shapes and sizes on the job site. I was personally in Miami, and we were doing an installation job, I was helping out there, and they wanted to uh, show about, uh, I don't know, seven or nine different colors. And as we were installing it, the designer was kind of like, well, can you cut a nine inch piece by 10 feet of this uh, blue, azul, whatever the name is, and, and let's just put it up there. And she wanted some this way and that way. Well, you know what was so nice? We didn't have to go to the distributor to go, buy the, that particular tile. We were, we were cutting them the way they wanted to, right on the drop site. So that was quite, quite nice. Now the next tool, Neil uh, spent some time on this. Um, this is called the Euro Notch. Some people call it a zipper trowel. And you can see it up there. Now, uh, what's important that we only have one notch size. And this notch size is good from a uh, six by six inch tile all the way to these huge panels. It's, the magic is the way it's shaped. And uh, long story short, we're using, uh, that's the equivalent to approximately um, half by three eighths. So less than about a bag or less than a bag of tin set will cover a whole panel. And we recommend to put full tin set on the back of the panel and also either on the floor or the substrate or the, the wall, and that way you have um, the proper um, thin set coverage. After we make the incision with the carrot cutter that I showed earlier, we are using some of these uh, sanding pads, diamond pads, 60, 200, 400, to dress up the edge. Some of those, uh, all of them actually, the little pieces that we handed out, we cut them here, and if you look at the edges, we use some of them were done, some of them were not. Uh, these edges are good enough to use them side by side or not just against the wall and, and use it as a grout joint, which is very nice. So you can fabricate your own tile right on the job site. Very important. Edge leveling system. We have these, uh, and if you like, you can uh, pass it around, a few of them. Maybe Brian can help me out. And uh, Tim, if you could hand them out over here. This is just one of them. There are manufacturers, they make. The, the point is that what Neil uh, showed a second ago, that was the same job site in Miami where the thin set oozed out. You have to have, the edges need to be covered completely. So the, the thin set will ooze up in between the tile. And if you, because they are recommending very high end thin set, which is very good obviously, but to go back next day and every 10 inches you have to scrape this thin set out. First of all, it's very time consuming and chances are that you're going to chip the edge of the panel, which will be an absolute nightmare, nightmare to remove it. So that's very important. This piece of equipment, we call it the, the Caro Edge, uh, for beveling, mitering, and bullnosing large panels. So now we're taking away a little bit from the slab industry, which is good for the tile industry. Uh, we can do now countertops, because we can finish the edge. Now some people like an, an edge uh, system uh, from different manufacturers, which could be plastic, metal, whatever they're made out of. Some people don't like that system at all. They want us to somehow finish the edge. So we can miter it, bullnose it, polish it, and, um, and bevel it. So that's, that's a pretty good idea. Now this is called the Caroflex uh, for plunge and air cuts. So picture this panel goes around that door frame, okay? And about uh, uh, two feet or 16 inches or whatever goes above the door frame over there, and we have to cut an L out of it. So with one, one, the short cut is going to be done with this equipment, which goes over the carrot cut. Very simple, it's a, uh, there's, a, there's a vacuum cleaner attachment, that you can't really see very well over there, so that sucks about 95% of the dust away. So just simply put it on the rail cutter, turn the grinder on, you can set the depth so you don't cut into your, your wood table, and you can make your first cut, and then we, could, we would finish up the long cut, which would be exposed, 
with uh, the snap and the score and snap cutter. So you have a very good edge, and of course it's very efficient. We were able in a, in a, in a, in a controlled environment, again, I say it was a controlled environment, we were able to, about three of us, install a, a panel in every 20 minutes, which, which is very impressive. You can put down approximately 40 square feet in every 20 minutes. That is a, a good, good uh, production, a lot of money in the installer's pocket. This is that Euro slide uh, that is against the wall, uh, fully extendable from five to 10 feet, and also we can make different variations, T, U, Z. Uh, for example, if you have a fixture like this in the middle of a lobby, and that's permanent, we have to cut the tile around it, and imagine if this is uh, only, let's say, 18 inches, and we have to cut 18 inches out of the center of the panel. That is going to be very fragile. So on these equipment with a suction cup, we can actually fabricate the tile without losing control. You have this spine system on it, then we put the tinsel in the back, lower it, pull it in, push it in, and uh, we're good to go. So this is the same uh, Euro slide that's extendable. Now this is called the Euro grip. This is for unloading, moving, handling, and back buttering of panels. And Tim and I, we're gonna show it to you a little bit, uh, you know, in a few seconds actually, how this is uh, being used. So pick, imagine a crate with 20 panels comes into the warehouse. And let's pretend, whether you are a distributor here in the audience or an installer, or somehow you are part of this business, uh, you, it's your best interest to have a safe way to get the panels out of the warehouse to the job site. Most of the time, uh, they don't need 20 panels, especially if the job is smaller. They only need eight or 10 panels. So with, with this system, we are able to take the panels out of the crate, and it's, it's particularly if the, if the panels are on the job site in the crate, and leave the panel on, the porcelain panel on the Euro grip, and we're gonna fabricate it, we're gonna drill a hole in it, we're gonna put tinsel on it, and we're gonna be able to take the panel never left the Euro grip all the way to the wall. And that is very, very important. Otherwise, if it's handled too many times, the chances are that somebody's going to chip the edge of the, the tile or break the corner off, and it's going to be very difficult to, um, well, it's basically a lot of, of time and money. This is the transporter that you see over there. I covered it already, so I'm not gonna spend any time on that anymore. Um, so what is the key to success? Um, do a good job and then you get paid. That's the key to success. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure uh, uh, Neil's going to so, take over yeah, again. Just kind of uh, wrap, wrap up the, the sort of the slideshow. Okay. We're, hopefully this has given you a taste. All right. Just like somebody who has read a book on surfing, you're probably not quite ready yet to go out and hit, hit the waves of, uh, you know, in, in Honolulu. But at least you have some idea of where to go surfing. This is really the key that we're trying to get across today. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, as you heard, there are no standards. Therefore, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. The industry certainly, certainly has converged. That's really been the message. A lot of folks have been working to get to one set of recommendations to take the confusion out because this really still represents an amazing opportunity for our industry. Uh, making sure that any tile that you use is the one that is right for the use. So floors, walls, inside out. All those things that can be questions that you'll have, talk to your manufacturer, get their recommendation, work with your mortar uh, supplier. They've got their recommendations. Uh, in fact, just uh, for grins and giggles, back on the back, there's a, there's a table with a set of recommendations from some people that we uh, know and love in the room that, that would give you a good example of it. All right, so please make sure you pick up one of those on your way out. Certainly the thin tiles, like we said, it's a great opportunity. All right. You need to be well armed with knowledge. You need to ask good questions, but it can be done. And once we've gone out and we've done training seminars, once people see it, try it, handle it, get a feel for what's going on, it's, first it's daunting, but they, there's a lot of true believers once they've actually had it, they, they, we can do this. And that, that you know, we can attitude is how we're going to grow the, grow the industry. So work with your manufacturer, practice, use the leveling systems. Those are the tools that have now been proven over the last couple of years to give us the best chance of success. And there are a lot of us who continue to work, like you saw with some of the pictures out there, to how do we keep refining it. There is still more news to come. Uh, well, there will be a lot of us who are continuing to give these kind of seminars over the next little while. Uh, arm yourself with that knowledge. Stay, stay abreast of what's out because there's a number of us that are trying to blast broadcast it to make sure there's no secrets. Uh, we'll be there with you. So. With, at that point, let me ask this. Do you guys happen to have any questions? If, please. Uh, you know, like, when you start, when you start like, 12 or 12, you will be a cheap one to take it out or to know. 
That's why, again, knowing where you're going, what you're doing, having handled the material, you, you chip the corner off of it, and if you need a 10-foot long piece of tile, that's not so good. Hopefully they want a couple of four- and three-foot pieces, and you can recover some stuff. But uh, it does require special techniques. They're big, they're fragile compared to you know, smaller tiles, but they can be handled. And they, the equipment is there to take the bumps and bruises out. You've got to have the right fork trucks. You've got to have the, a lot of things to do this right. That's why you've got to be educated. You've got to have the right equipment. Uh, and breakage will happen, but we've all been working to try to minimize that because you break one of these pieces of tile, it's not cheap. The best advice I can give you is, is good for you that you're here today. Because that means that you are interested to be educated and see what's out there. There are also other seminars. Different manufacturers, all of the most manufacturers, they have their own facilities where they teach. Or we train the trainers, and then they train some everybody else. Because uh, uh, again, nobody's perfect, and and there's going to be a time where you chip the edge, and you're going to find a way to use that. That's the nice thing about this style that you can fabricate it. It's not garbage. You still have a huge piece of panel that you're going to use somewhere else, unless you're doing an airport that is you know, 50,000 square feet, and then maybe you can afford to chip a couple of pieces because the job is big enough. The point is that if people use the right equipment and they are familiar uh, with the whole system, it is, it is quite an easy uh, process, but you need to touch it. You, that's why we're going to have, be a, have a hands on in a minute where you can come up here and see what we do with the, these different equipment. Again, we're going to show you when you guys come up here, but this uh, uh, water dam, which is also a guide, is a regular cordless drill. And if you have to do it on the wall after installation, we have a water hookup system over here, either with a wet saw pump or a pressurized tank. The water simply scores through here on the diamond, and then you can start a hole and drill. It takes about, on this panel, approximately uh, 8 to 12 seconds per hole. On the floor, you pour a glass of water in the same system. You have a camera going on there? Oh, that's fantastic. OK. Um, again, the water is contained, no mess at all. You start up the hole, and it's very easy to drill a hole. We have from 3 16 of an inch to 4 and a half inches, everything in between. This diamond is a, a diamond electroplated. Diamond core bits. Diamond core bits. Yeah. Hole saws. Hole saws. Yeah. That's kind of the beauty of this. A lot of this equipment didn't exist a couple of years ago. Now it's now it's readily available uh, from from manufacturers so that you can you can solve these kind of problems. Any other questions? No. No, because once you put the, this tile in the thin set, it's there. I mean, it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to drill, especially if the pipe's sticking out, it's impossible to put a tile up without a hole in it. So you care for measurement, and you can fabricate it either on the table or on an equipment like this. And then you put it up in the tin set. Yeah. You, you'll be amazed after working with the material how easy it is to cut and how easy it is to drill. But you just got to practice with it a little bit and like anything else, get used to it. And it won't take you very long to get pretty comfortable with the material. Also, think about traditional tile, dust press, uh, mold press tile, has a certain amount of tension in it. And it can, when you cut it, particularly if you make a compound cut, it can shank and break. This tile is made without a mold, and, and, and the inherent tension is not in this product. So it receives compound cuts and bowl cuts much better. Than let them cut a piece of them a little bit. We took a hammer at one of the facilities, and I don't know how many times did we, four or five times, Tim, before it actually broke. With a traditional porcelain, you look at it and 
Yeah, the, the, the demonstration of watching these guys hammer on a piece of tile that's just sitting there on the tabletop and banging on it for all they're worth, and they're not wimps, uh, is pretty impressive. The mesh back material yeah. has mesh an impact back. resistance. Go ahead. Brent? We found that a lot of times the template of something is a bit of a thing. You know, we've got a lot of tight back splash, those types of things. Actually, you can take the template out of it, transfer it. So we have to steal, steal some technology from the slab people, because that's what they've been doing forever. Make a template. Good question. Good. Any other questions? OK, at this point, we've got a demo. All right, we're going to set up and, and show you how to cut one of these large pieces of tile uh, with, with the rail cutter here. So we've got the camera on. We'll let the, the guys start getting things ready to actually do a cut. Once, once you've seen the cut, um, you know, you're welcome to come up. We'll let you play with some of these things, look at the tools, and, and try that. Okay, so what we're doing here, we, don't, we couldn't bring up an actual crate. So what we're going to do, we're going to kind of pretend we have a crate here. Tim? Yes. Oh, we're gonna, what we're going to do now is we're going to grab this panel, and we're going to put it uh, face up. So what they're doing is kind of simulate when you receive this material on the truck, it's going to come in wise. It's going to need 84 inch forks to lift the crate so you don't damage it from underneath with 44 inch forks. So we're kind of showing you when you receive the crate, it's going to come, you know, a certain number of sheets. So we're going to kind of simulate by laying the piece on the floor how you would initially use the tools to get the material out of the crate. And then the other thing is, so this table we fabricate a cabinetry of plywood and saw horses. It's going to be crucial that you use one of these on your job site. You're not going to cut ten foot pieces of tile on a little four foot square table. It's extremely important that it's flat, it's well put together. Either you build your own or work with somebody to get a table. The table is a crucial part of the workspace environment. So, good. When we move these panels, uh, it's no accident that, in other words, when you're standing here and you want to lay it down, you don't. You don't stay on the end and just let it lay down. You have to move around the tile. We call it the choreography. You have to kind of really sort of uh, dance with these panels a little bit. And that means you always have to lead and you always have to keep the support. We're going to lay it down, but he's going to move over so that we've got hands at all the right spots so that when we bring that panel down, it's as well supported. Let's go a little bit forward, OK? A little more forward. Yeah, so we have more room in the back. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Also, you need these. Hot day, you're sweating, you've got to have gloves. If your hands slip off these panels, you just lost three to five hundred dollars. So when you grab them, you want to make sure you own them. And not to mention that, but also the ones that are fiberglass mesh backed, you also want them to have gloves on as well. So this particular tile doesn't have the fiberglass backing on it. All right, so let's say that this is the open side of the crate, because we do recommend, we don't have a picture of a crate here, uh, to remove one side of the crate. Yeah, normally the frame's going to be a little bit wider than the crate. So you would take one side of the crate out, and yeah. that's going to allow you access to not only the top panel, but the last one from the back. Yeah, so at this point, the Euro grip is on the panel face up. Fortunately, they send it face up, which is very smart of the, the factory. So now what we're going to do is we're going to <coughs> attach the grips, the, the suction cuts, one by one. The suction cups have a play on purpose. They're not solidly attached to the frame. One of the reasons, and I'm going to spend much time on this, when you get it in the crate, the floor is not going to be perfect. So the crate will pick up the shape of the floor. If you have a rigid frame without any movement, you're physically not going to be able to attach the suction cups at 12 different points. And so that's one of the reasons. And the other reason is it's very good to check to make sure that we have a good bond. If these suction cups move on the panel, then something happened. One important uh, feature that we already did, please take a cloth, wipe the surface of the panel off, because that would be a problem if it was full of dust. So at this point, we're going to take it out of the crate. Put it back on the wheels. And there's only two of us that we did this. So now it's out of the crate. 
These wheels were locked in, but we can unlock them so they would draw easily. So at this point, the best thing to do is stage it. So we have a crate. For example, we didn't have a luxury over here, but we would have the workbench right here. So we don't have to travel too much with the panel. So from here, we would pick it up and put it on the, on the table. And probably we should uh, move this cutter for now because we would like to show you quickly. We're going to pretend how we would back butter this piece of porcelain. To see why they're working because of the system that we have, I can move this huge panel by myself, line it up with the table. Okay, now Tim and I, we're going to pick it up, put it on top of the table. And now we're ready to apply the pinset. So the, the best case scenario is to have a workbench like this and two horse saws, because technically we wouldn't need a table with a plywood to put a pinset on. So at this point, we'll apply the pinset. Thank you very much. These gloves are good, but you can't spread pinset <laughs> unless you go like this. So in one direction, the short way is the best way, so the air, air escapes fast. Let's, let's apply the pinset, edge to edge, perfectly covered. In the same time, the second installer, so now we, we're encouraging two minimum. Three would be a good team, would be perfect. So the second guy would put the uh, installer, would put the tin set on the wall while I'm doing this by myself over here. When we're both done, we would come together, take it off the table. Okay, put it on the floor. So at this point, we, know we can, don't have to go too far. Let's say the wall is where the projector is. So Tim and I, we would come over here. The tinsel is on the wall. We simply lift it up. Tim? This panel weighs about 92 pounds. When you mortar it up, it gains about 35 more pounds. How much is the grip? 45. Do the math. It's a pretty heavy load, but by the time you mortar it up and lift the frame into position, you're looking at 150, 160 pounds lifted. So. Appropriate lifting technique. So this is also where we talked about the thixotropic mortars that stay where you put them, both to hold the tile as well as not running off the side of the thing. But as you're moving this around, the mortar holds its ridges. It stays there. Uh, it gives you an advantage uh, in not having slop all over everything. And this is where the third person would come in handy. And Brian, if you can be the third person, you could be in the middle. Sorry? Where are we going? Nowhere. We're just going to pretend that we put it on the wall, just like this. Yeah. So this is the wall. We lift it up, put in the tin set, make sure that, that it's all good. Don't release the suction cups before you adjust the panel, because it's a lot easier to grab this frame than trying to move the panel without a frame. And then we release the suction cups, and we're good to go. Now, let's say this was a horizontal, right? If we did vertical, then what we would do, because this, is, this would be good for you to see, is you can leave it like that, Brian. So let's say Brian or Tim would pick up the frame from the middle, and we're going to go this way. Okay. You got feet down there. I got feet down there. You got, okay, you got feet down there. Then we're going to, okay, so, excellent. Okay, we got feet down here. These feet are, by the way, very important. They adjust to the, the floor, they are angling, they are fully adjustable feet. And the feet would be touching the subfloor instead of the edge of the panel, because that's another area where somebody could chip the edge. After we went through all this work, imagine lifting it up and breaking the edge off. That would be a disaster. You just want to make sure when you initially suck it down that you're going to put it about, you know, an inch uh, inside the feet. Yeah. So when the feet touch, they can touch first. And you're not resting any other weight on the panel itself. So. Okay. So when we're done with that, we would pick it up. You ready? Uh, yeah. No, no, no. We did this way. We're going to lift it up like this right. with the You're panel. This yeah. Okay. Like the, this edge is going to gotcha. be on the floor. Yeah. So I'm going to lift it up. Okay. 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 That's why I didn't want to go. But okay, there you go. Timber. There you go. So now you either have to learn how to jump really high to release the last suction <laughs> cup <laughs> or have a ladder. That would be better, a ladder. And then we release the suction cups, take the frame off, 
Any questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, this one has a quick release where the wheel section would come off completely. So it detaches. Yeah. Okay, we can put it back down. Well, you know what, since it's up, sorry Tim, since it's up, let's pretend that we're going to install it on the floor. So we would, we would now, if this was a floor application, you guys ready? Okay. So this would be the floor application put on the floor. Same thing. Make sure it's straight. Release the suction cups. And we're good to go. We can adjust that. This one, like, if they wanted the walls to be like, like, let's say, like, four feet. You know, like, uh, Yeah, the frame actually, you know, comes apart. And you can move it into sections and move things around. It's actually very versatile. So the joints. So we have this is three sections A, B, and C, and you can you can manipulate it. Correct. And then in for another. Thank you. This is an addition to the Euro grip. Very user friendly. So we go from five to ten feet. Just like that. So to answer your question, we could easily uh, adjust it and we push it back together like this. And at any point, and then of course, uh, we can also loosen up these two screws and bring the two spines closer together. If we had a narrow piece that was very long, so it's fully adjustable, very light, but this was probably weighs um, maybe 25 pounds. And it would super. Yeah, please, we would like you to get involved if you like. <laughs> Huh? Two weeks ago. <laughs> Tell you what, when you take it at your end, raise it up and use the wheels as you raise it up. Let your muscles work to the point where the wheels will work. There you go. And if you want to do the installation on the wall, you're going to roll it right down there and put it right up on that wall. And the center panel's going to weigh it. We'll about that. Yeah, this is a full problem. Yeah, we're gonna cut a piece. Yes, we're gonna cut a piece. Yes. No side conversations. All right. For those for those of you that may need to uh, take off, because we're getting close to the end of the time, if you've got the speaker the speaker uh, surveys, we really would like that, so we make sure we're getting the information to you. The uh, the uh, the woman standing here in the middle holding up the the yellow cards. Please make sure you give those to her. Cause she she needs those. Otherwise, you know, she gets yelled at. So now we're ready to cut some pieces. Anybody else got a card to turn in? Got about 12 inches. 12. Okay, so um, obviously we would use a tape measure. We're not going to take our time right now. Just we're going to do about 12 inches. You can go all the way like this. Okay, so once you have the desired uh, section that you want to cut off, we would attach the carrot cut with the suction cups to the tile. So if for some reason the panel moved, the cut would be always true. Doesn't matter what happened. So if you, if you can see from there, we can step closer. This carriage is spring-loaded. And then we would start from the edge of the panel, about half inch from the edge, pull it back, just to make sure that we don't miss it at all, miss it at the edge. And now we would go forward. Before we release the suction cup, we would pull this out, line up the incision with the edge of the table. About there, you okay, Brian? Okay. Now we're going to release the suction cup. We're going to push it back. 
And now we're going to say three, two, one, go. Yeah. So that's a very good edge, and if for some reason you didn't. Yeah. Don't, think don't, that don't, that was guys, good. Don't, don't feel it until they do a, do a diamond down the side because it could be sharp and want you to cut. So this was the cottage, right? Uh, so we would take a, a, like a 200 first, for example, or 60. Slide it back. Brian can finish it up. Correct. Good point. So now you should be fine. Okay. Well, while they're taking the diamonds to the edge of the uh, of the tile, is there anybody else who's here for AIA credit who hasn't signed the magic form? Okay. Anybody else who's trying to get AIA credit that needs to sign the form? Okay. Thank you. Very good. Absolutely. So just just to show you how forgiving this material is, I'm going to take let it go, please. I'm going to take my chance by myself, hold it from the center, how much it flexes. It's incredible. So it's a lot more forgiving than people think. All right? Yes. I mean, two, two guys with gloves on both ends. Some cups, you know, are better than, than just holding with the glove. You can do it, you know, if it's possible. But you got to really make sure you coordinate. You know, you got to make sure when you pick it up, you make the step which direction you're going. You don't want one guy to go right, one guy to go left, and then you yeah. trip over a bucket. But you know, you can't make it like sure. it's not like that. For sure. I mean, no. But a simple twist around the corner would be enough, especially with a thin set on it. Plus, not only that, when you have thin set, if you had to put your fingers into the thin set to grab onto the tile, that would be a problem because you wouldn't have 100% coverage. Okay, now, if anybody wants to, would you like to cut a piece? Oh, sorry. You know. So this end on the, of the cutter should line up with the tile, approximately, something like that. You don't have enough for the suction cup. Okay, then we're going to put it closer. We yeah, we'd pretend that we measured. So now you touch the suction cup and the carriage starts from this end. Oops. That's okay. I, I forgot to flip that up. Sorry. Give me a second. It's time to yeah. There's actually a stopper here, so you can do that. <laughs> So you start about half in from the edge, push it down, pull it back, and then continue all the way. Okay? No, 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 okay. Very good. So now we pull it out. So since we got a smaller piece, we're going to use a, a device called uh, the separator. Okay. But it's better to use either the separator or the pliers. And all, you want, all you have to do is release the pressure here on both ends. I'll make a suggestion. Use the pliers because they would come in that kit. This wouldn't. That's correct. Uh, uh, for the 5.6, I know. It's. Uh, I have we have them right here. Maybe Brian can, or somebody can do the honor. This, this one doesn't have mesh, so you gotta remember to catch the piece. Oh, see? See? Because if you, if you saw when he made this. Yeah, he missed uh, a little bit. Off the edge, he went off the edge, but he came back hard over the edge. Okay, so let, let's, do it, let's do it one more time, okay? Let's go, don't worry about the suction cups. All right. If you don't mind, I'm gonna put my hand on your hand. Just to, just to feel the. Okay, so go ahead. So what you want to do is this. You, want, you can listen. Don't push it too hard. Go back. Okay, now we're going to go back and start from the edge. That's what you want to hear. Excellent. Yeah, Noah made a very good point. You have to make sure that you hold on to this, at least two people. Because that could be dangerous. So now, I'm not sure if you can see from there, but this... I opened up the separator with a knob on the bottom, a clamping knob, put it right under the incision, turn it upwards. There it is. Okay. 
And when it comes to small pieces, it would be good to to do it on both sides. Once you get used to it, especially with the 5.6, you can snap it over the edge of the table, but you want to get used to it first. There you go. Anybody else would like to try it?